at the FBI. Congressman Louis Gohmert will join us in a matter of moments. He grilled Strzok on his dishonesty, and he got personal. When I see you looking there with a little smirk, how many times did you look so innocent into your wife's eye and lie to her about uh, Lisa? Mr. Oh, Chairman, this is outrageous. It was, it was like a, row, a rowdy college dorm at times. Congressman Trey Gowdy ripped into Strzok as well. I don't appreciate what was originally said being changed. I don't give a damn what you appreciate, Agent Strzok. Strzok himself could not avoid grandstanding, saying the entire affair played into the hands of Russia. I have the utmost respect for Congress's oversight role, but I strongly believe today's hearing is just another victory notch in Putin's belt and another milestone in our enemy's campaign to tear America apart. But what role did he play in all this? Fox Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge is live on Capitol Hill. Catherine, 12 hours, 13 hours, 72 lawmakers. What did you glean from it? Well, in the last couple of hours, we've had some additional headlines, Brian. Uh, what I want to point out right now is an interesting exchange, which was about Peter Strzok's removal or termination from the Russia Special Counsel investigation in July of 2017. And we learned that Robert Mueller never asked him specifics about the anti-Trump text messages. Here's that exchange. I want to know if Bob Mueller asked you about this text message. Uh, Director Mueller did not ask me about any text message, Congressman. Well, gosh, what, I mean, just days after Mueller is appointed, in two text messages, one on the 19th of May and one on the 22nd of May, you reference impeachment. Did, did Bob Mueller ask you why you were referencing impeachment? The Congressman, as I just stated, Director Mueller did not ask me about any text message. We also got more insight from Agent Strzok today about that infamous text from August of 2016 when he and Lisa Page talk about stopping Trump. He said today that that was a reference to a lot of anger he felt after what he described as then candidate Trump's belittling of a gold star family. Here's that exchange. My presumption based on that horrible disgusting behavior, that the American population would not elect somebody demonstrating that behavior to be president of the United States. We'll stop it. You were speaking on behalf of the American people. Is that correct? I don't recall writing that text. What Are you I denying you, writing the text? What I can tell you is that text in no way suggested that I or the FBI would take any action to influence the candidacy Agent of Agent Strzok. Strzok. That, that is a stuff. fantastic answer to a question nobody asked. Yep. Agent Strzok was also pressed on another series of texts where he was very disparaging about Trump supporters in Virginia and that key phrase that he could smell the Trump supporters. Here's that exchange. What does Trump support smell like, Mr. Strzok? Sir, that's an expression of speech. I clearly wasn't smelling one thing or the other. What I meant by that was living in Northern Virginia, having traveled 100 and 150 miles south within the same state, I was struck by the extraordinary difference in the expression of political opinion and belief amongst the community there. And from you where described I live. that as smell in capital letters. Sir, that was a choice of the quick choice of words. Democrats said today that this was really testimony designed to dirty up and damage the special counsel Russia investigation. And they also made the point that if Agent Strzok had this tremendous anti-Trump bias, why didn't he leak information about this counterintelligence investigation during the campaign when it would hurt candidate Trump most? Here's that exchange. If you had wanted to uh, harm and interfere with the election of President Trump, you could have leaked information that the investigation was ongoing, but none of that came out. We also have new information tonight about the FBI lawyer Lisa Page. She was under the threat of contempt earlier this week, and she's now agreed, Brian, to a closed-door deposition. So that's a transcribed interview behind closed doors uh, tomorrow, Brian. Unbelievable. I don't know how you could possibly get to every question I have for you, Catherine, but basically the overview. Peter Strzok says, yeah, I wrote those mm -hmm. things. I'm allowed to write those things. Right. I shouldn't have wrote those things, mm -hmm. but it didn't affect the investigation. We don't know yet 
what happened with the Russia investigation. But in terms of the Hillary Clinton investigation, is he right? Is there any proof of bias in the way he went about Mm -hmm. this? I think that he made overly broad statements about the findings of the Justice Department Inspector General. The Justice Department Inspector General, in fact, found that when you get to sort of August of 2016, when there's that text message about stopping Trump, that was the point at which the Inspector General said, whoa, like we have changed from expressing an anti-Trump sentiment to talking about taking some kind of action. And he said from sort of there on going forward, you just could not reach the conclusion that actions were taken without political bias, so kind of trying to prove a negative. So Mm -hmm. Agent Strzok was very um, generous, if you will, uh, in terms of his interpretation of the Inspector General's findings. And I would also emphasize to folks at home, the Inspector General was not looking at the impact of any political bias on decision making about the opening of the Russia probe and the early days of that investigation. That is going to come at a later date, Brian. Yeah, and Catherine, finally, uh, in this investigation, Mm -hmm. you did not get him to answer the question, what does he mean about stopping Trump? He doesn't remember writing that. Is that acceptable? Well, there was some conflict in the testimony, Brian, about that specific text. At one point he said, I I don't remember writing it, and then he said, I I remember writing it late at night and that I was driven uh, by anger. The bottom line with the text messages, and I think this is a big important takeaway, is when you talk to people like I have in law enforcement and intelligence circles, they will tell you that if you're working in counterintelligence, one of the things you do not do is send a lot of text messages, especially text messages about personally compromising information, because that is the kind of information a foreign intelligence service Mm -hmm. looks for in order to compromise you. Agent Strzok was the number two person at the FBI in this area. He knows that our intelligence services are looking for exactly this kind of information about an extramarital affair to use against someone to bring them onto our team. So in many respects, that was one of the cardinal rules that agents struck broke, and that's really shared by a number of law enforcement gotcha. and intelligence contacts. Oh, yeah. He's to blame that we're in this spot and that we had 12 hours of testimony. He wrote those texts. No one asked him to. And he had a very prestigious job that made anyone question the outcome. Catherine Harridge, great job. Thanks so much for setting us up. You're welcome. All right. One of the Republican lawmakers there, Louis Gohmert, and things boiled over with him during the hearing. He blasted Strzok for the impact he had on public trust and the FBI and his personal behavior. The disgrace, Mr. what this man has done. The gentleman from justice. Texas will suspend for a there moment. There is the disgrace. And it won't be recaptured anytime soon because of the damage you've done to the justice system. And I've talked to FBI agents around the country. You've embarrassed them. You've embarrassed yourself. And I can't help but wonder when I see you looking there with a little smirk, how many times did you look so innocent into your wife's eye and lie to her about uh, Lisa? Mr. Oh, Chairman, this is outrageous. The credibility of a witness Shame is always you, an Chairman. issue. Mr. And you Chairman, please. Have you have you know, Mr. Chairman, this is an intolerable you harassment of the witness. What's wrong with that? You need your medication. It was a free-for-all, and you heard that comment, and do you need your medication? Congressman <laughs> Louis Gohmert, did you lose your temper, or did you intend to bring up his personal life decisions? No, I didn't go into an intending to do that, but as I sat there listening to him so smugly, his little smirk, and he lied repeatedly, and he knew he was lying, he knew I knew he was lying, and yet he still would lie. And I'm telling you, it, it, the, the unfortunate thing is about that last exchange I had with him, um, it uh, may have clouded over a very, very important story, and that is that he was told by the uh, intelligence community inspector general's investigator, Frank Rucker, that they had found an anomaly in the emails going to and, and from Hillary Clinton's unauthorized private server, and it It was uh, when they forensically examined the anomaly, they found embedded information, and it was a foreign entity, not Russia, but a foreign entity that was uh, 
that was getting every single one of her th over over 30,000 emails. So wait, Congressman, just to stop you Russia. there, just it to stop there. Russia. So you're saying that in Hillary Clinton's emails, they were forwarded to somebody else? Yes, and it, it was because they were hacked. And Horowitz didn't point that out, you know. They and and uh, the previous story, you know, that Comey gave us. Well, it was not a good server. It was possible that it got hacked, but there was no evidence it was hacked. And then we find out, and that's what I brought out today, that the intelligence community. IG brought it to their attention gotcha. and they did nothing, nothing. And this is a foreign entity not mm -hmm. related to Russia in the least right. that is getting everyone. There were only four of over 30,000 emails gotcha. they didn't get. They were going to and from. Congressman, she compromised America's security. Uh, Congressman, one of the many people who questioned Peter Strzok today and will probably question Lisa Page tomorrow at about 1.30 yeah. Eastern time. Congressman, thanks so much. Thanks, Brian. You're All right, Democrats took to their turn of questioning to Peter Strzok as well, though obviously they had a very different tone. For example, you're here and you're not taking the fifth. That's correct. Did you consider taking the fifth? No. Why not? Uh, I've done nothing wrong. Well, that was Congressman Eric Swalwell of California. He joins us now after a marathon day that was flat out riveting television. Congressman, first off, your take. Are you under the belief that Peter Strzok should not have had, uh, been forced to come in and speak or come in on his own and speak? Did you see any merit to him being there? Well, good evening, Brian. I, I just think this was the wrong hearing with kids separated from their families, and this committee has jurisdiction to do something about that. But he was there. He certainly should answer questions about those texts. I didn't like those texts either. I've said before that if he was working for me, he would be gone by now. But I also believe that they never affected any decisions he made, and there were a lot of people making decisions in the investigation, and we should prioritize our time in other directions. So, uh, Congressman, the Inspector General report on the Russian part of the investigation has not been out, just the Hillary texts. So you have to wonder, if someone's going to investigate Brian Kilmeade or Eric Swalwell, I just want to make sure they didn't have agenda against me. And when you have things, and I'll just repeat them, if it said blank Swalwell, uh, blank is a, uh, Swalwell is a disaster. I could smell the Swalwell supporters. Uh, we'll stop referring to, uh, uh, re we're going to stop referring to Swalwell's candidacy for president. Just ripping him. And then it turns out that he's doing the investigating. At the very least, don't you feel as though it's contaminated, let alone should be examined? Yeah, well, I... I don't believe it's contaminated in the sense that it wasn't valid, but I do think Bob Mueller made the right decision to pull him off the team. I was a prosecutor uh, for seven years before coming to Congress, and I've dealt with issues uh, in the investigation. And what I would always do if there was a question about what a police officer did is I would try and corroborate the decisions they made and the investigative tactics they used with other outside evidence. And here, he was not the one who set up the Trump Tower meeting. Peter Strzok was not the one who had Donald Trump's lawyer communicate with Felix Sater and try and arrange for Putin and Trump to meet so they could, quote unquote, engineer the election. And Peter Strzok was not the speechwriter when Donald Trump told an audience, Russia, if you're listening, you'll be rewarded right. if you're able to get Hillary Clinton's emails. Well, that wasn't a speechwriter. He was, uh, it was a press conference. And if you're, you could argue that if you're saying something like that, you couldn't possibly be guilty of that. But he was do this. And tell me if I'm wrong here, Congressman. He was the one who interviewed Michael Flynn. He was the one that finished off the Hillary Clinton interview. He was the one who got a hold of the Anthony Weiner laptop and somehow mysteriously waited three weeks to tell James Comey or Andy McCabe. We still don't have the answers there. He is implicated in somewhat of this dossier. He might have dealt somewhere with David Korn, who wrote Russian Roulette and others. So there's a lot of questions. He's in the middle of everything. He's like Zelig. Absolutely. However, I, I don't want to make a more significant than he is. Uh, and on the Michael Flynn case, Michael Flynn pled guilty. He didn't have a gun held to his head by Peter Strzok. You know, he's pled guilty and is now cooperating. And so I also wanted to point out with him, and, and he said that he was not the sole uh, investigator to close the Hillary Clinton case. He was not the sole investigator to open the Trump uh, Russia investigation. And so, again, I think as the public learns about more of the evidence we saw in the House Intelligence Committee and more of the evidence that Bob Mueller is reviewing, they'll have a lot of confidence in the work that the FBI did to start this investigation and hopefully 
to close it soon. Right. And you and you were prepared and you did bring up all those things in your introduction. You did say something else uh, right in the beginning when things got totally out of control and we didn't have enough cameras to cover all 72 of you. Uh, you said, hey, wait a second. Let's bring Steve Bannon back in and we need to question him. Could you ground that in and where that come from? Sure. Uh, Mr. Gowdy uh, was threatening contempt uh, to Mr. Strzok for not answering questions. And that actually set a bell off in my head because I remember Mr. Gowdy asking Mr. Bannon in our House Intelligence investigation questions that Mr. Bannon refused to answer. And Mr. Bannon was under subpoena, but the Republicans on the committee refused to actually hold him in contempt to try and get the answer. So I thought if we're truly interested in getting answers that witnesses refuse to answer, then we should subpoena Mr. Bannon before the committee, just like they're doing to Mr. Strzok. Of course, they voted against that. Interestingly, though, Trey Gowdy did not vote while he was present uh, in the hearing. Um, I also think uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt in terms of his questions and an insight. And, you know, we called out the president once and said, Mr. President, if you're innocent, act like it. So I think that he's as good as it gets in terms of preparation as well. But I'm going to bring this up. Lisa Page is coming in Friday. One uh, thirty, we understand. What questions do you have for her that might be different than you would have for Peter Strzok? Well, again, I, I think we're putting our priorities in the wrong direction with family still separated, and we're going to spend hours again with Ms. Page. But I would want to just corroborate what I learned from Mr. Strzok, which was that there were many other individuals involved in both closing the Hillary Clinton investigation and opening the Russia investigation, and to make sure that this was not limited right. to just Mr. Strzok and Ms. Page. Uh, that's a good point. It's just amazing. You have to bring in, everybody has to bring in other people involved to get over the fact that you can't get past the bias that they put in black and white. And if I wrote a script about an investigation, they would hand this back to me and say, it's too deliberate. Give me some new ones. These text messages are so egregious, we almost had to have a day like this eventually. But I understand there's a lot of things going on. Congressman, always appreciate yeah, your insight. One of the most interesting people to talk to in Washington. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, meanwhile, Congressman Trey Gowdy, also one of the most interesting people in Washington, pressured Strzok repeatedly about his apparent, okay, confirmed bias against Trump during the 2016 election. You're eight days into your Russian collusion with the Trump campaign investigation, and you got another text from your uh, colleague, Lisa Page. Trump's not ever going to become president, right? Right? And you replied, no. No, he's not. We'll stop it. What I can tell you is that text in no way suggested that I or the FBI would take any action to influence the candidacy a of Agent candidate Strzok, Trump. That, that is a up. fantastic answer to a question nobody asked. It was the existence of your bias that got you kicked off. No, Mr. Gowdy, it wasn't. I do not have bias. It is not my understanding that he kicked me off because of any bias, that it was done based on the appearance. If you want to represent what you said accurately, I'm happy to answer that question, but I don't appreciate what was originally said being changed. I don't give a damn what you appreciate, Agent Strzok. I don't appreciate having an FBI agent with an unprecedented level of animus working on two major investigations during 2016. Did you pull your foot, uh, foot off the gas for Hillary Clinton, and did you go ahead and screw up uh, the Donald Trump investigation, at the very least, you contaminated it with your text. Joining us now is Terry Church. He's a former deputy assistant at the FBI's counterterrorism division. He joins us. First off, I got to ask you, does the FBI look bad today or does Peter Strzok look bad today? Well, unfortunately, the FBI looks bad because Peter Strzok looks even worse. I thought we might go into today and uh, maybe we could start rebuilding and uh, regaining the trust of the American public uh, as a result of this hearing. It actually got worse. I mean, you see very clearly not just the, the bias that he took into this case, but what really hurts and something I never saw in 30 years in the FBI, and that is kind of this disdain and contempt for what I think is the American public in general. I've never seen that in the FBI. I mean, FBI agents, FBI employees usually can get along and be out there and be around everybody. But when you start calling people deplorable and you go into Walmarts and you text messages that people smell, I mean, he didn't explain any of that. Uh, you, you just can't be that way and be in the FBI. And, and remember, he's not just any FBI agent. I mean, I know the Democrats on the committee want to make sure people think that. But he's the deputy assistant director, or was, of the counterintelligence division. He had major say in the decisions in the course of these cases. And in fact, he had a major say in everybody working for him and the morale of people and in their own attitudes.
You cannot lead and have this attitude, and he can't tell me that he withheld the way he feels about all these things from everybody that worked for him right. and around him. I just don't buy that. Terry, what about this? Bob Mueller, head of the FBI for years, gets rid of Peter Strzok, but never told him it's what the reason was. He ends up in human resources, from the fourth most powerful person of the FBI to human resources, and he's not even curious why. One of the problems, Brian, in Washington, D.C., and it's not, not, just, not just in this case, nobody really at a certain level communicates with anyone. So I can buy off on that, that Mueller might have said, you know, really? it's been nice knowing you, but you're going to leave. But in fact, never really got into any detail. I can really see that happening because that's the way they talk there. And that's one of the reasons we're sitting here today. People at a certain level like James Comey, Andrew McCabe, don't feel that they need to talk and communicate with people right. about some of the reasons for their actions. Right. Terry, uh, thanks so much. Uh, a sad day for the FBI, especially with the smugness of Peter Strzok. That's the way he came off to me. Thanks so much. Welcome. Meanwhile, uh, our coverage of this marathon Peter Strzok congressional hearings continues. We got more insight. Kim Strassel on deck. Don't move. Tucker Carlson is brought to you by the... For some reason, Democrats were eager to show support for Peter Strzok during today's hearing. Congressman Steve Cohen compared Strzok to American soldiers killed or wounded in the line of duty, saying he, Peter Strzok, deserved a purple heart for his efforts answering questions. And at one point, when Strzok went on an extended justification of himself and his actions, committee Democrats actually burst out into applause. Listen. It was in no way, unequivocally, any suggestion that me, the FBI, would take any action whatsoever to improperly impact the electoral process. And the proposition that that is going on, that it might occur anywhere in the FBI, deeply corrodes what the FBI is in American society, the effectiveness of their mission, and it is deeply destructive. The, 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 Mr. Chairman, I have a motion. Where does the applause come from? Why is he worthy of applause after what we already know about his actions? Kim Strassel joins us now from the Wall Street Journal editorial board. She joins us. By the way, you got voicemail if you call Kim, Kim today because she watched like I did all day and were riveted by it. Was his comments after Trey Gowdy's questions worthy of applause in the Strassel household? Of course not. I mean, look, there has been deep destruction of the FBI, but much of it has come from the text messages that have been exposed and shown that we have FBI agents that exhibit this degree of animus while working on presidential campaign investigations. So you have him going through this saying there's no bias there. You know what one of his reasons for saying no, the, the investigation wasn't contaminated? There are other people below and above him that would have checked him had he tried anything. So there were people below to overcome his bias. And by the way, if you think there's no plan, what about the insurance plan reference never explained? What about we'll stop him, won't we? Yes, we will. Stop him from what? He doesn't even remember writing that. Brian, this was an incredibly disingenuous answer that he gave about the checks above and below. First of all, we know from Jim Comey that he wasn't involved, and many in the leadership were not involved with the day-to-day -day investigation decisions here. That's why Peter Strzok was the lead investigator. And on any given day, at any given moment, he would have been and could have been and was making independent decisions that influenced the course of this investigation. So obviously, he had the ability to take action. Uh, that wouldn't have been questioned and might have been motivated by bias most likely were. James Comey was basically the king in this. He didn't do any of the work. He just took the copy. He was the one with his sleeves rolled up doing the investigating for Hillary Clinton, for Michael Flynn, for uh, doing the investigation on the Russia side, the Anthony Weiner laptop decision to push it forward. Now, Kim, you wanted me to bring you to Jim Jordan's questioning of Peter Strzok. He was uh, relentless in pushing to find out about his role with the dossier and what Bruce Orr's role was doing. And he, of course, with the FBI, who's wife worked for the group that got the dossier to begin with. So let's listen to this exchange and I'll get you to comment. Are there three copies of the dossier as, as evidenced by what you said in this email? The McCain copy, the BuzzFeed copy, and the one that you got from Corn and Simpson. The most I can say is we received a variety of copies of and different types of Let me ask you reports. one other question. What Agent Strzok won't answer fundamental questions like the guy he references in an email, Corn and Simpson, and won't tell me who they are. 
This is unbelievable. David Korn, a Mother Jones who wrote Russia, co-wrote Russian Roulette. And then you have Simpson from Fusion GPS who commissioned Steele to go ahead and do this research. How significant is it that those names turn out in an FBI counterintelligence investigator's email? Yeah, it's very important. And, you know, by the way, if anyone deserves a medal today, it was Jim Jordan for relentlessly pursuing this. So much so, look, the FBI was advising Mr. Strzok not to answer any questions, but Jordan was hitting this so hard that even the council backed down in the end and did give Strzok permission to provide some very modest information. What he did give was important, which is that we now have some questions about how many versions of this dossier were actually out there. Uh, was there, uh, did he have a copy that was different than the ones that was released to the press? Uh, did he have uh, his own method of communication with Fusion GPS because he was using these people's names uh, in the email? But more importantly, we found out that Bruce Orr, who was a Department of Justice official, married to Nellie Orr, who worked for Fusion GPS, was indeed serving as a conduit between that uh, opposition research mm. firm and the FBI, passing along information from the group that had been hired by the Hillary Clinton campaign. Which he never admitted that he knew. He didn't even say, I don't know if it was a DNC thing. I don't know if Hillary Clinton paid for it. What do you mean you didn't know? Comey had the same answer. That is terrible investigative if you don't know where your intelligence is coming from. Kim, are you writing tomorrow? Yep, I am. Uh, not on this, uh, but, but read it anyway. It's on taxes. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, I'm against them. So we'll see where you stand on that. Kimberly Strassel, thanks so much. Appreciate it. She writes for the Wall Street Journal, which I get for free. We'll have even more on the Peter Strzok Capitol Hill showdown right after the break. We have to wrap up 12 hours of testimony. Only the Tucker Carlson show can do it. At least keep your fingers crossed. I think they can.